Hello, welcome back to another Ask Lattice. Today I have James Walker from the Sheffield Climbing Clinic. Uh, I've got the name right today. Sorry about that in the other <laughs> video, James. <laughs> um, you hopefully will recognize James from a couple of other videos that we also have done previously, looking at some common climbing physio uh, issues and injuries. And James has run through those. We'll put those in the links below so you can go and have a look at those videos. And today we've got him on the sofa again with me going through some more common kind of issues. And we're gonna kind of tackle uh, in a few different videos actually. So first one that we're gonna do today is gonna be around hand and finger injuries. What I thought would be kind of useful to, to start and for the viewers as well is if you can run us through the kind of basic anatomy yep. of the hand and the fingers. Like what is going on under that skin? Yeah, yeah, of course, no problem. Um, so yeah, the first thing to say is um, finger injuries are the most common thing we see at the clinic, for sure. Obviously climbing, you get a lot of injuries around the body, but um, finger injuries are the, are, are the most um, common really. Um, okay, so in terms of running through uh, the anatomy, um, Let's start off with the uh, flexor side. Most of the injuries within climbing come on this side of the hand. And you mean flexor is, you mean doing yeah. this? Or was, is there two different sides that they're called? Yeah, exactly. So you either got the, what we call a flexor side where you're flexing, so flex the hand or flex the elbow, flex the wrist, or you have the extensor sides okay. where you um, extend. In terms of more formal anatomy, they would be called the palmar and the dorsal side and yeah. when we talk about a little bit of the anatomy at the moment those words are, are used um, so yeah in terms of the hand um, each finger so let's talk about the fingers uh, to start with so each finger has two flexor tendons uh, running into it okay and um, they come from two muscles into the forearm um, and are called the uh, flexor digitorum profundus and flexor digitorum superficialis, okay? Yeah. So in each of the fingers, those tendons uh, run down and um, one of them attaches to the, to the tip of the finger and one of them actually comes and attaches earlier on just below that. And they basically allow between those two uh, tendons when the muscle in the forearm contracts, for you to be able to move those joints uh, individually, um, basically. And are those running from, so the tips of your fingers all the way down to the middle of your forearm, the elbow, or is it sort of spread out sort of like a, almost like a web internally um, in the forearm? Yeah, so, so, they, so they come and attach into the inside of the elbow. So we talked the last time um, about golfer's elbow yeah. and those two muscle groups come and attach. So, so basically the, um, two muscle groups I've just talked about, the yeah, uh, flexor digitorum profundus, flexor digitorum superficialis are the, the muscle, and then they have the attendants that attach. So they actually, the muscle is all into the forearm. Mm -hmm. the, you do have muscles in the hand, which we'll talk about uh, in a minute, but um, the, the tendons of these muscles run into the actual fingers themselves. So yeah, the, the, the other end of the muscle is the tendon that attaches on the inside of the elbow that gives you golfer's elbow, does that make yeah. sense? So, yeah. Um, so, so that's that. So yeah, you've got um, those tendons that uh, run into the hand and then surrounding those tendons, you have something called a tendon sheath, okay? Um, think about it as a, a sort of tunnel around uh, the tendon. If you think about tendon like a rope that kind of moves and uh, is attached to the actual bones and moves the bones, the sheath is something that encompasses that. Um, and the point of the sheath is to protect the tendons, but the main functionality is to provide something called synovial fluid, which is basically uh, a lubricant of, of uh, that. So if you think about it, when you open and close your hand, these tendons kind of uh, move and move the joints. And if there wasn't any um, uh, lubrication, that would cause some problems. And also this synovial fluid has um, some uh, chemicals in it that help sort of keep the tissue healthy. Um, sort of the nutrition of the tissue. Um, and actually that is one of the reasons why finger injuries in climbers often takes quite long because if you have a muscular injury, for example, any muscle but a calf muscle and, and you even tear that, it has a blood supply. So it has a very good blood supply, so it heals a lot quicker. Whereas these soft tissue structures like pulleys and tendons and things like that, they get most of their 
um, ability to heal from synovial fluid and that's why they take, they're, they're called connective tissue, they're not kind of contractile tissue like the muscle, uh, the muscle is, so that's one of the, the, the issues with them really. Um, Okay, fine. So there are the, the tendons. You also have a, an extensor tendon. So this is just a single tendon that runs uh, into the back of the finger. We don't really see too commonly that in climbers, to, to be perfectly okay, so honest. There's not many injuries as usual, that? No, not really. Yeah. No, we don't see too much. We see some traumatic ones. I've seen, I've, I've seen a few injuries of that at the clinic from rockfall. Yeah. People actually having traumatic, because if you think about you're climbing in this position, rockfall, it's going to probably hit the back of the hand. So I've seen a little bit of that. Um, but they tend to be um, traumatic injuries in terms of some sort of direct blow or a cut or something like that, rather than um, the typical kind of injuries that uh, climbers will get, which are these kind of um, injuries from, from actually climbing itself, if that makes sense. Yeah, so that's the, um, the tendons and the tendon sheath. Um, so the, uh, the flexor tendons themselves um, are held down to the... Um, to the bone by um, five annular pulleys. Yeah, so okay? like rings, basically. Rings, exactly. Imagine you've got, um, imagine you've got like a, a, a rope um, and then you've got like a sort of um, semi-circular kind of ring over the top of it, mm -hmm. um, ring of, of connective tissue, basically, and that's the, the, the pulley. Um, and yeah, climbers will recognise uh, these because a lot of climbers will have had pain in these areas from this area between the MCP and the PIP is where the A2 pulley is. Um, between the PIP and the DIP is where the A4 pulley is. They're the most common pulleys injured in climbers for sure. Um, you have an A3 pulley over the, the top of the um, the PIP and also you have an A5 pulley into uh, right near the tip of the finger. They're not commonly injured in climbers. And then the only other one is the A1 pulley, which is just um, down near the actual MCP. Uh, we sometimes see that in climbers. We don't really see it. Uh, we don't often see injured climbers, but you can get something called a trigger finger, um, which is when uh, the tendon um, develops like a nodule and it, and it kind of catches through the actual um, through the actual uh, A1 pulley. Um, so yeah, the pulleys are pretty important. You also have the, the, the joints into the, the finger. So you have uh, three joints. Um, the first one is called the metacarpal phalangeal joint. Uh, you have the proximal phalangeal joint and the distal sorry, the proximal interphalangeal joint and the distal interphalangeal joint. That's yeah. a bit, all these names are a bit complicated to be honest. Normally, they normally have acronyms, don't they? Yeah, like PIP, DIP, MCP, is yeah. what we would write them down as. Yeah. So in terms of this joint here, um, we, we don't see too many problems with this joint at all. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the MCP. The MCP, so yeah. the metacarpal phalangeal joint. So basically in the actual hand itself, you have the metacarpals, which are, the actual long bones into the hand uh, and then a bit lower down than that you have the carpal bones um, which are the bones into uh, the, the hand itself and then the wrist and then the radius and, and dulna. So yeah the first one is called the metacarpal phalangeal joint because it's a joint between the metacarpal and the first phalanx um, of the finger but yeah we don't see too many problems with this one. Yeah. Uh, the next one is called the, the proximal interphalangeal joint and then, the, yeah, you've got the distal interphalangeal joint. So proximal just means closer uh, and distal just means further away. So it's proximal because it's closer than this one. And then interphalangeal just means because it's in between this phalanx, which is a bone, and then this one here. And then you have another joint and then you have another little phalanx or bone there, basically. And we, we do see quite a few issues with these um, these joints within climbers. Uh, these joints are known as synovial joints and what that basically means is around the actual joint itself it has a joint capsule um, and again that is filled with synovial fluid and it helps to lubricate and allows um, the joint to move smoothly um, and that also provides some uh, nutrition to the um, to the joint itself but we see issues with these in climbers because that joint can get irritated and, and climbers will, uh, we'll go into a bit more detail about that later on, but lots of climbers will have actually pain and discomfort around these, uh, around these joints themselves. Um, so that's most of it in the actual finger. Oh, actually, no, um, you have 
uh, either side of each uh, uh, of the joint here, you have something called collateral ligaments. Mm -hmm. um, the collateral ligaments are definitely more prominent in like the knee joint. So for example, in the knee joint itself, there is uh, two collateral ligaments um, either side. Actually, the knee joint is actually quite similar to the joint in the, in the finger, although there's a few big differences. But in terms of what we call the collateral ligaments, they go either side of the joint. And, and what they do is prevent movement sideways uh, like this. Yeah, like uh, when, you, when you're in uh, like twisting in pockets, pockets and you're crack climbing exactly, and things. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, crack climbing, twisting in pockets, or actually uh, another way that we tend to get people get issues with that is when they say fingerboarding, um, not having a good alignment in their fingers. A lot, a lot of people when they fingerboard don't have um, the right alignment, not really looking at what they're doing with their hands. So sometimes you can get a, a, a slight sort of deviation of that. And if you're doing max hangs and things like that, then that can cause problems. So. Um, yeah, we, we, you have two what are called collateral ligaments on either side of the um, uh, joint. They're not as distinctive as the ones in the knee because they're probably more like what we call capsular thick thickenings of the actual synovial joint capsule. But, but you can see them um, uh, when we do imaging and things like that. And you can get uh, injuries in those from what, things like you say, pockets and twisting type injuries. Um, and then, yeah. In terms of muscles in the hand, often lots of people ask me about this. They say, well, do you actually have muscles into the hand or is it all from the uh, forearm? And, and the answer to that is you do have muscles in the hand. The most relevant one to climbing, I would say, is um, a group of muscles called the lumbrical muscles, um, which are quite commonly injured in climbers, especially uh, when doing like two finger pockets and things like that. And they're a really interesting muscle because they actually don't have an attachment onto a bone. So most muscles have an attachment um, onto uh, a muscle, to a tendon, a tendon, to a bone. However, the lumbrical muscles, they're quite interesting because they, uh, the origin of them is actually on the flexor tendon itself. And then they actually pass through um, and, and attach onto um, something called the digital dorsal expansion, which is kind of... Um, uh, a bit of kind of like connective tissue or um, what we call fascia that comes around the actual uh, back of the joint. And those are the muscles that actually allow us to pinch. They're, they're really interesting muscles. They help to flex the MCP um, whilst extending the, the, the PIP. So they allow you to do this type of movement. But very rarely do they get injured in this position. They often get injured when people are doing like two finger pockets when they have another finger tucked in. Again, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then the only other muscles in the hand, um, these tend, tend to not get injured in, in climbers, but just to give some um, anatomy, I suppose, um, you have something called the interossi muscles. So you have the, the, the dors, uh, dorsal and palmar interossi muscles. And to a certain extent, they kind of sit in between the uh, fingers and, and they help to open and close oh, the, the, the Spock exactly, Star yeah, Trek yeah. thing. So, yep. so your ability yep. to, to open and close the fingers come from these little uh, muscles called the, the interossi muscles and, and help to open that. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's an, 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 an anatomy, anatomy yeah. overview of the, of the hand. I thought what would be a nice way of kind of going through each of these injuries because I know I know you'll say it's like I can't give out specific advice to a specific person who's watching on a video because everyone out there is going to be very different mm -hmm. but what we can do is we can look at you know how are these injuries caused in the finger yeah you know what are our signs of it what's actually occurring in the yep. finger and then some common approaches that you know people watching out there would yeah, typically sure. take with this stuff so can you tell me first of all about what you know what's what happens? How do we do a pulley injury? Yeah, so I suppose you would categorise um, pulley injuries into probably uh, three categories, really. Um, and that would be um, a strain yeah. to the, the pulley, um, a partial tear of the pulley, um, or a full rupture of, of, of the pulley. Um, so the, the main, so, so basically what happens is, yeah, the, the flexor tendons run through this series of uh, pulleys. Um, and what they're trying to do is when we put stress through the fingers, with climbing mostly in a kind of half crimp or crimp position, that kind of um, uh, tendon is being sort of stressed and pulled away from the bone, but the pulleys hold them close in there. Mm -hmm. The nice analogy is um, uh, a fishing line going through the eyelets of a, um, a fishing rod. And if you've got some stress onto the end of it, if those um, eyelets weren't there, the, the line would just come away completely from the, um, 
from the fishing rods and it wouldn't function. And that's kind of in a similar way what happens if you get an injury to uh, the pulley. That's something we, we know as bowstringing. You, yeah. People may have heard that term before and it kind of means that the actual um, uh, tendon is coming away from the from the bone. So in terms of um, what people will recognize as, a, as an injury, lots and lots of climbers who are watching this video will have had pain and discomfort at the bottom um, of their of their finger in here which is the a2 pulley and a lot of people will also will have had pain and discomfort onto uh, this one so in terms of if we talk about a pulley strain itself um it pretty much i would say exclusively happens in a half crimp or mostly full crimp position um and yeah in terms of a pulley strain that can occur not necessarily for an incident. People might be doing a root or a boulder or, or, or whatever, and um, they might just come down and think, maybe not think anything of it, or after the session, they might get some pain. And most people, they kind of uh, sort of palpate or poke into the actual pulley, and uh, that will feel quite sore. Now, in terms of the differentiation between that and actually a tear, almost always, if a climber will hear a pop and, um, that's something that most climbers, not most climbers will have had before, but most climbers will have kind of heard or talked about. Or I've, seen done, a video. I've done that a few times in my life. Times, yeah. Yeah. So basically what will happen then is that you're pulling hard or you're crimping um, and then you will go to do a move or you'll maybe be static or um, your foot will slip or something like that. And you'll hear, or literally hear a pop in the finger. And there's sometimes cases of people, you can hear it from five, 10 meters away. It can be really loud. And from, to be honest with you, from my experience, um, because in the clinic I do uh, scans, I ultrasound scan the, the fingers. Um, so you can literally see the, the pulley if it's intact or not, and you can measure the tendon and bone distance. I would say that almost certainly if there is a pop, that there has to be a um, partial or full rupture of the actual pulley. So in terms of if people have thought, okay, well that's happened to me, is it serious or is it not? Most of the time, if you didn't have an injury where you pulled and something kind of went pop, it probably is just a strain. Um, and if you heard a pop, there's probably a partial or, um, or full tear of the, of the pulley itself. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, um, and in terms of those uh, pulley strains, um, once we've kind of you know identified that that may have occurred, whether it's through bow stringing or an ultrasound, yeah. What are the the common approaches that you would typically, or and the tools, I suppose, as yeah. well that you would look to to you know carry out that rehab and make that that recovery from that? Because well, it's pretty problematic for your your climbing uh, if you yeah, have a sure. injury. Yeah, for sure. So the first thing to say is that the best thing that climbers can do is actually um, realize or accept that they do have a finger injury. Because as you know, probably personally and from loads of different people, the first thing that people try and do is think, okay, well that's sore. Um, how do I climb around it? Do you know what I mean? That's the common thing that climbers do. Because interestingly enough, with finger injuries, if you imagine an ankle injury, you really badly twist your ankle, um, you're just completely limited. It's not like you can get around it. You can't wait there, you can't walk, and you need to sort of, and very naturally you would do the things that are necessary. You would start off on some crutches and you would slowly build it up and, and kind of things like that. With finger injuries, what climbers tend to do is they think, well, I'll just use back three or I'll just use front three or I'll just do half crimp only and things like that. So the first thing that, that one of the best pieces of advice is to kind of, uh, yeah, in terms of, well, first of all, try and get it assessed uh, professionally if, if possible by someone who, who knows about finger injuries. Um, um, however, those tips that I just gave about recognizing if it's a, a, a strain or a partial tear, it would be to sort of accept it and actually rehab it. So if we have a pulley strain, what are the kind of tools that we can, and approaches that we can use to address that kind of injury? What, what are we looking at here? Um, okay, fine. So for a strain, that is as well. For a strain, yeah. So yeah, there's a big, big difference between strains and uh, partial tears or, or full tears. Um, and the reason being is because with a, with a full tear or partial tear, you actually have to have, give time for the um, tissue to heal itself. So with partial and full tears, we, we normally advise a period of um, immobilization, or for example, we actually used um, splints, uh, what we call pulley protection splints. Um, so it's very, very different because you actually need that tissue to kind of heal again. With a strain, you do need that to heal, but there's nothing that is hugely 
um, going to take the same time scales as something that's actually uh, torn. So in terms of what we tend to advise, if someone comes to me with a, with a strain, uh, they will recognise it by the fact that they'll have pain on, on half crimping and certainly pain on, on crimping. And they might kind of think, I'm not sure if I should be climbing or not climbing. Sometimes people actually feel that they can climb. Um, and more with kind of partial or full tears, you probably just don't feel like you can climb at all, you just don't feel like you can weight the finger. So what we tend to do with a, with a strain, um, we, we do tend to probably get people to have a, a few weeks off climbing, uh, maybe just a couple. Um, and then in terms of- And is that uh, off all climbing or just harder, moderate climbing? Can they still go and you know, do some slab climbing or? That's the yeah. That's that's a good question because um, is it too specific? But. The problem is, and and it's it's very tricky with with advising climbers on that because as you know yourself, if you give them say we well, can do a little bit, they'll probably do a lot <laughs> yeah, more. That's true. Yeah. Um, and also, climbers are very good at getting around a finger injury. It's like well if I've injured my ring finger, then I'll just use my sort of front two or, or the, the understanding of, well, if I just open hand, then that's not going to put any strain on the pulleys and things like that. So a lot of the time we, again, it's very difficult because it depends we, the actual severity of it, but we sometimes, yeah, quite often advise a, a couple of weeks off because what can sometimes happen as well is a simple strain that could take, you know, a few weeks off and then get back into climbing and, 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 and build it up slowly. And, excuse me, and within a month they're kind of okay, it can just grumble on. It can just be irritated and grumble on and they can become a little bit sensitised and, and things like that. So, yeah, we tend to, with a strain, advise a couple of weeks uh, off, really. Um, and then in terms of returning to, to climbing and ways that they can start to kind of load the finger again, there's a few really useful tools and it's kind of simpler the better, in my opinion. You know, a fingerboard um, and a portable fingerboard is, is really, really useful, actually, because fingerboarding, if you have a finger injury or a strain of a pulley, having to take uh, weight off, um, with a pulley system or with bands or anything like that can sometimes uh, be a little bit of a pain. Whereas a portable board is a really nice way to build that uh, build that up. So, so, so yeah, kind of like those lifting methods, basically, rather than having the yeah. fingerboard above your head, above your head, doing the, those light lifting exercises. Because then you can add like two, three, four, five, six kilograms onto that, and then do exercises when you're lifting. And the same similar sort of way to fingerboard protocols. Um, but in terms of the rehabilitation for it, if it's a strain, um, most of the time it. it I always say to people, rehabilitation and uh, training are very, very similar, um, but they are just much different in terms of the amount of load that you're putting through. So in terms of how to rehabilitate a pulley strain, it would be have some time off climbing, uh, let it settle down. Um, we often recommend taping then as well, um, taping the finger whilst you are climbing, starting to climb open-handed, starting to, to fingerboard open-handed, uh, portable board, and then you just slowly build that up and progress uh, over the weeks. Um, again, it's very difficult to give an exact kind of uh, protocol for that. Um, but in terms of a pulley strain, it usually is quite simple and people can uh, climb within a, a couple of weeks, really. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how does that compare to, you know, our full ruptures and tears? And I've had a couple of these yeah. over the years. And I think my, my methods originally were very, very poor and they took months and months to get better and I'm so how long would it have taken for you want you know what time scales do you think in terms of a so it took nine months for me to be able to get over my first ever yeah. proper pulley tear and nowadays with the clients that we work with we see much better recovery than that and I think it's probably down to the fact that you know we have yeah. better methodology nowadays Absolutely. So in terms of just, just, just giving you some timescales, if you have a, so, so the A2, the A2 and the A4 are, are, are different. An A2 um, rupture is, is more severe than an A4. We actually probably see them the same, most, uh, the, the same amount. Is, most people think A2 is the most common, but we tend to see the same amount and research shows that as well. Yeah. Um, however, an, an A2 pulley is more severe and takes longer to get better than A4 just because of the mechanics, basically. Um, in terms of just rough timescales, if you have a rupture of an A2 pulley, um, and again, that would usually be when you have a, a pop, you hear a pop when you're pulling and then you have pain located in this area. You do, uh, just again, quickly going to recognising that, the, the problem sometimes with pulleys is you don't get um, a lot of bruising or swelling afterwards. Sometimes they do swell, but they don't often bruise. And often people have good movement. Often people come and see me and we uh, will scan the finger and they, they're really surprised it's ruptured. 
because they just don't, they're just like, it doesn't seem to feel too bad. And sometimes they've even gone and tried and cli- gone to try and climb again. And they were like, oh, it, was, it was, I thought it felt sort of okay. And I was open hand and I was just doing easy stuff and, and whatever. Um, but in terms of time scales for that, just, just roughly, um, we actually don't, with an A2 uh, full rupture, we, we wouldn't get people climbing for six weeks. Um, we would actually uh, put them in a, a, a splint, something called a pulley protection splint that we actually make and mold to their finger. If people don't have access to that then um, doing some kind of um, uh, finger taping like a H taping method is good to support the finger um, but yeah we don't usually recommend climbing for, for sort of six weeks um, and then in terms of return to climbing um, it would be again a nice slow and steady return into the methods that we just talked about before in terms of open hand and then half crimp and full crimp but actually in terms of someone getting back to climbing hard about three months if they do it correctly so the idea of nine months that's what I was talking about in terms of not following a process and a protocol and actually listening to the injury and just sort of taping it up and going out anyway um, you tend to get all sorts it just doesn't heal properly and, and you, you just get much more pain with it and it doesn't um, allow it to kind of um, get where it needs to be before you start loading these, load it too early. That's why yours would have took so yeah, long. Yeah, well, I mean, like, most of my issue, I think, was the fact that I didn't do anything with the finger for weeks and weeks, months and months. It just, it was so painful. I just avoided everything on it. Yeah. And then when I finally got back to it, it just felt so poor and tweaky and stiff yeah. and immobile that I couldn't hardly use it anyway. Yeah. Whereas... In the subsequent years, now later, I've done, I've gone back to very, very light fingerboarding work. Exactly. So much earlier and in a very, very progressive way. Exactly, yeah. And I've rehabbed it. Yeah. Just much, so, much better. So in terms of just general processes, in terms of after six weeks, we get people to start some climbing and it would be nice, steady climbing, uh, building up. But but we would get them to do fingerboarding straight mm. away as well. And in terms of a rough protocol with that, you can do your standard things. You can do your, you know... Um, six reps of 10 seconds and and taking lots of weight off open hand to start with two out of 10 amount of pain is absolutely fine uh, probably a bit more frequent than usual because you're taking lots of weight off so it maybe you do three or four sessions a, a, a week of that um, and then you see how it feels see how it reacts and then you progress slowly uh, through that and also a lot of people will think that once they have a full rupture or, or an injury to the a2 or a4 pulley they shouldn't get back to crimping and things in the future but as t- this is not right at all we have lots of people who have full ruptures of the pulley and they get back to complete full normality and we've scanned people sort of way down the line and everything is just kind of um healed nicely um and it's holding the tendons down and they can just get back to normal to be honest yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, excellent so in kind of um I suppose in conjunction with that, uh, we talked about at the beginning the uh, the joints in the fingers, and I think uh, for the kind of the the last part of today's um, discussion, it'd be really nice to get your perspective on joint irritation, mm-hmm. joint pain, inflammation that we may have um, in the range of the joints across the fingers, and again the same sort of thing about like how do we know what's going on Mm -hmm. how do we recognize it and the kind of common tools and methods that we'd use to address that yeah okay so actually uh, it's it's quite interesting because the information out there online and when people talk about it generally and uh research and things like that tend to mostly focus on the pulley injuries because they are definitely the most common however i would say in the clinic we see almost as many joint issues and people definitely come to us with less idea about what it is or how to actually deal with it. So you would have um, seen lots of climbers who they kind of put their hands down like that and they look at the joints and they're kind of thickened and swollen and and, and, and whatever. Um, and the reason, for that, <laughs> the reason for that is because actually over time, you put so much stress through these joints that um, the, the tissue tries to become more resilient by kind of um, sort of uh, becoming a little bit thickened. And sometimes you get little irritations as scar tissue builds up and, and, and things like that. So some climbers actually just have chronically kind of thickened joints, but sometimes they don't have too much pain with them. But what we t- tend to find in terms of more um, acute joint pain or more kind of ongoing joint pain is that most likely what's happening is, is the person gets what we call like a synovitis. And, and what that basically means is that around the actual joint, you have this joint capsule um, and that itself becomes irritated and becomes a little bit inflamed. So there usually is an actual um, inflammatory kind of component to it um, and and the joints become uh, irritated and sore to move. Sometimes what happens is that the, the joints actually just become what we call dysfunctional. So 
a classic thing that initially I was really amazed about, but the more climbs I see, it's it's just common. The ability for climbers to do this, and I don't know if you can do that yourself, to kind of completely uh, bend that one down, to have a straight sort of uh, joint at the back and to bend these fingers in like so. The amount of climbers that come and see me who are just kind of here um, is, is quite, well, I say it was surprising, but not anymore because we see lots of climbers. But um, basically what sometimes happens is they just don't have the range of movement in the joints and it becomes a bit of a of a cycle in terms of uh, it just can't function properly and then the joint becomes irritated because of that and, and so forth. So to allow you to do all of these hand positions and grip positions when you climb, you need to have fully functioning joints and full range of movement. And that's how joints stay healthy as well. So yeah, in terms of recognising that, what most people will uh, find is that they have this almost non-specific, you know, uh, pull these are very, very specific. Someone will come into me and they say, it hurts here yeah. and that's it. Yeah. And it's probably going to be the A2. It hurts here, it's probably going to be A4. With the joint, they say, well, it's a bit kind of sore around here and maybe at the top and, and then you actually poke it and oh, that's sore there, that's sore there. And it kind of is all around the joint. And it's associated usually with um, stiffness, uh, with, with soreness again, with loading the finger, but not so much of an acute pain like when you have a pulley injury or strain where you just kind of get an acute pain. It's just kind of like, well, it's just a bit sore. Most people can still climb through it, um, but they just get this kind of sore, stiff, uh, swollen joint, which doesn't move very well. So in terms of what we tend to do for that, it's actually um, a lot more kind of basic. It's very, very rare that we have a period of an acute joint injury that needs immobilization. It needs kind of um, a, a recovery in the same way. Nothing needs to actually, nothing's been damaged often to the point where it needs to heal like a, a ruptured pulley. It tends to just come on slowly and things like that. Or like you were saying before, you can sometimes get it from a, a maybe like crack climbing or pockets where you're twisting or not fingerboarding correctly, having this kind of deviation of the, of the joints. So what we actually do is a lot more basic for it. We tend to do um, more what people would think of traditional kind of rehab or physio approach. So we do a lot of like, um, uh, and I know this is a little bit of a controversial one, but I, I definitely like icing. I promote that. And the reason I like icing is because it tends to dampen down a little bit of inflammation and it allows people to move more easily. Also, icing does help with pain. People tend to feel better for it afterwards and then they allow them to do their exercises. But really, the aim of a joint issue is to... Um, decrease the inflammation that's in there. So we tend to do that with, with, with icing. Um, uh, there's sometimes some thickening around the joint capsule. So even simple things like I do encourage massage as well, um, okay. kind of around the actual joint itself and, 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 and uh, to a few. And I, and I assume that's more effective by doing it yourself with your hands rather than things like these uh, rings that the slide up and down. Rings. Yeah, that's a good they point. seem very low load I compared guess so, to what yeah. you do with Yeah, people hands. do like those though. People do say that they help and whether that's because um, it just encourages a bit of blood flow to the area or whether it's because it works a bit on the pain gate mechanism or whatever. But yeah, in terms of actually getting some of this kind of thickened and scarred tissue that sometimes builds up uh, worked out, then that can be a, a, a nice way to do that. And then we really, really encourage uh, joint mobility. So something again, as dead simple as kind of doing these, people know them as like tendon glides. Um, and, and we didn't necessarily talk about that too much after a, a pulley injury, but these kind of uh, tendon glides are really uh, useful, but for joints, they're really useful as well. But you're not actually gliding the tendon, you're trying to improve the range of movement of the joint. And really what people want to do is to aim to get their full range of movement in that position and this position. And also sometimes it just won't go. So they can do these what we call passive glides to the, um, to the passive mobilization, sorry, to the actual joint and with the aim of over time restoring that normal uh, movement into uh, in, in, into that sort of joint. So, so yeah, that, it tends to be quite simple really in terms of the actual um, treatment for more joint, joint issues um, rather than uh, the pulley, which is probably a little bit more complex. Okay, yeah. oh, that's really good. Um, well, um, thank you for that, James. No worries. That was great. Um, so we've gone through our pulley injuries, our joint irritation um, and inflammation. Um, and we are going to also do some more um, mm -hmm. video content on some of the more sort of unusual or less seen, but also interesting finger injuries yep. um, in another video. And uh, don't forget for James, we've put the links below in the description for his physio clinic. So you can get in touch with James if you want to book in any appointments with him. And otherwise, we will see you again very soon. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. <laughs>